and what is your background we Thank can you. start from the we yeah, can yeah. start from actually yeah we can start from anywhere you like and then Unjani, uh, first and foremost, thank you, yeah. bye, for coming to Sidecar and also having me in your podcast program. Uh, my name is Yang Duk Lama, and I am originally from Darjeeling, and I have been living here in Delhi since 26 years now. 26 years. And uh, uh, my my span in terms of bartending has also been over 26 years. So that's. where it all happened as in it started way back in 1995 i came as a small town boy into delhi a uh, hotel management graduate i joined a hotel not to intentionally become a bartender but to become a hotelier interestingly i was sent to the bar so that's where my journey of bartending took off so no formal course it was purely been straight away on the job at the hotel bar and that's where i learned the basics of bartending just going back to the um, so you always wanted to be a um, person to be behind the fnb or what was your dream when you i'm sure the lifestyle in darjeeling that we just came back from the or kursong was very different mm. than the, any other city right so when you were when your childhood you always wanted to be like in the food and beverage industry or you had something else you wanted to be no so If you ask me from that point of view, you know, as a child, I went to a boarding school yep. uh, in Darjeeling, but uh, I didn't have a clear ambition. So I was a very average, mediocre student, <laughs> not very good uh, academically. But uh, all that I knew was that I would excel in things which required a lot of physical activity. So I was good in sports. Yes. And I always wanted to figure out what could I do uh, in terms of my career choice. And then when I was in my, I think. when i was in my 11th or 12th is when i figured out that the only option for me was to do hotel management because it didn't have any of the subjects that i didn't like to study so it didn't have history geography no science you know no maths no chemistry none of those and that's how i actually joined hotel management not with the idea of becoming a food and beverage professional but with the idea of doing something that does not involve a lot of studies right so that's that's how <laughs> that's a short call i was like okay i want to do something <laughs> so it's a it's a very it's a very hill boy kind of a thought yes. concept because you know happy go lucky life uh, like i said we we had the best time in our boarding school yeah. always played never studied so as i as i kind of grew up uh, when i did my 10th and when i started to look at other batchmates of mine who were you know people some of them were preparing for engineering some of them were preparing for medicals and i was this one guy who was not so sound academically and that's when i had to figure out something and that's how i discovered hotel management so i i did my hotel management from calcutta and then came back came to delhi to work so no purpose thought process as far as food and beverage is concerned So that's why sometimes when people ask me how did you become a bartender yeah. I always say <laughs> I am an accidental bartender. <laughs> accidental bartender. I'm not a bartender by intention. So I didn't intentionally want to become a bartender. The good thing is I think it's a accidental discovery but a good accidental discovery that kind of led me to enjoy the last 26 years being yes. the stick. <laughs> that's a lot of a lot of time actually Uh, if you mention like is accidental uh, discovery, but you really enjoying it, I mm. see that. I've been to both of your place. For 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 me, and I think for most of us, also um, when we join F and B, is it's kind of um, getting away from the hard study, right? As you as you just um, talk about. So for me also, when I came to bartending, also it was like, but I wanted to be a chef. That was the one thing. Mm -hmm. So I was as I, from the day one, okay, I wanted to be a chef. So oh, that's that was nice. the thing that. Oh, that's how I ask people. So when they often be like, "Oh, how, do you want to be?" With? I recently talked to um, one of the guy in Darjeeling. He want they the parents force him to be an um, engineer mm. and on the study engineer, but eventually he becomes something else. No, but it was also somewhat similar when I joined hotel management. During the course, I was good in the kitchen, so I was good in cooking because I was anyways cooking even when I was a child. I yeah. used to love cooking. So cooking was something that was already there within me, and even during my industrial training, I did realize that I could join the kitchen. But uh, to me, kitchen was a lot of hard work in the initial years, 
particular as a youngster, right? Yeah, and that's I how I choose to be FNB because in FNB, you could be a little naughty, you could still see the both of, you know, the good of both worlds. So yeah. you could be in the front yeah, of the house yeah, as well as the back of the house. Yeah. So yeah. that's, um, <clears throat> so that's bring you to the FN, uh, bartending. And during these 24, 25 years of your experience, you, now you raise, um, I would say you're very successful in this uh, business. So do you have some sort of goal? Okay, like I'll be going there. This is my, like, you know, like this is the my road. This is my destination. Do you have those kind of things? Or you like, just go away? Okay, <laughs> let me try, you know, like uh, try my luck and I'll just do business. So how does it? So my 26 years journey has been purely one day at a time. So if you ask me, where do I see myself five years from now? I have no idea. Yeah, okay. Uh, what I like to do is, I whatever there, whatever is there in front of me, I like to give it my best shot. So, and the last 26 years, that is exactly what I've done. So whether it was learning a cocktail, whether it was work, working really, really hard, or whether it was gathering knowledge, or whether it was spur of the moment recipes, interacting with guests, everything for me has been for the moment. So I live for the moment. Having said that, I do have an ambition, right? I, I have an ambition where I want to be, like today I have two bars, but I have an ambition of maybe having more bars, yeah. you know, more concept-oriented yeah. bars. But at the same time, I'm not ambitious. I don't have a, a timeline for it. So it might happen in one year. It might happen in 10 years also. So you believe it, in organically growing. Exactly. And it may never happen as well. So, you know, both ways. Okay. Up till now, I think luckily for me, the last 26 years, everything that I thought that I wanted to do. It may have taken a little time, but it has finally happened. And whenever it happened, I just feel that that's the right time, right? So so I think it's been a great growth for me, but honestly speaking, I do not have anything in mind as of now. So if you ask me, what do I want to do in the next five, years, next five years? I don't have a clear plan. Having said that, I do have a certain ambition. So I definitely want to do more bars. Yeah. I definitely want to evolve myself as a professional, yeah. you know, uh, whether it is expertise, whether it's learning something new. So therefore, one of the things that I'm very open to is learning from young people like yeah. you, right, who have a very different experience than I had 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so I keep myself open to learning. And I think that is one of the best things that I've had in terms of my enjoyment of the journey. Uh, through these almost over two decades. Yeah, that, I think this is very um, fascinating and I would say it's very um, something that we should learn. Like we <laughs> should open to to adopt, you know, like a, if it's a new thing or young thing or old thing, whatever it is, you're very open for you. This is what Suman and we were discussing. You're a fun person to hang out with. You're like, you're serious when you need to be serious, but when you need to have fun, you're like, okay, let's have some fun, right? Hmm. But getting back to um, Darjeeling, how's the childhood in Darjeeling? Because when we <laughs> see um, the mountain, like it is a really hillside, right? But hillside, not hillside, hillside, there's a roads. So yeah. like, it's like a, 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 a like 10 minute, up road and the city and 10 minutes up the city. So how do you guys spend your childhood? Like you guys play around up and down, running in there and how does it, what kind of sports you guys play there? Oh, it's a lot of physical because uh, of course now everybody's so tuned to their mobile phones. Yes. But uh, back in the day, as far as we are concerned, I think as a child, I had probably had the best time because I used to mingle around with other children in the village and we used to play all kinds of sports, whether it was hide and seek, uh, and you've been there, you've seen the tea bushes yes. and all of those things. So we would play a lot uh, in the mountains amongst amongst the tea bushes. Hide and seek was one of the things that we all played together. Then there were all, a lot of the local sports, you know, like uh, uh, in Nepali, we call it pandunge and stuff like that. Know, where pandunge? It's like you, you, you have this ball and you break in the center and then you have two teams and then you keep hitting. Really? Uh, so yeah, we used to <laughs> have the sport where you take those flat stones, yes. pile it up in the center. Okay, okay. And then you have, so you, you, you have two teams and then we hit and we break it. Once we break it, then our job is to set it right. So while we are setting it right, the, the other person tries to hit you with the ball. So either is to dodge the ball. So the idea is to dodge the ball and set up the stuff so if you can do it before before all of your teammates get hit by the ball then you win the game oh my God. so it was very local that, yeah, yeah it is a very local sport the other thing that we played a lot as child as as a young child is something known as chungi yeah chungi, <laughs> chungi <I know. laughs> so we, it used to be made out of feather yes or rubber band rubber band we did i think the feather one is very popular in Hong yeah. 
Yeah, so the feather one, you know, I saw a lot of Jackie Chan movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the but the feather one was difficult to make, so we used to make something similar with rubber band, and it used to be an anytime sport. So anytime you're free, you have another friend, you play chungi, right? And you used to, if you have more people, then you used to do two teams, and uh, it was great. You know, these kind of sports, very innovative sports. Innovative sports, yeah. and also um, include. Uh, t- I mean the, um, the the stone game you mm-hmm. mentioned. I don't know what's that. Pandunge. <laughs> Pandunge. It needs uh, teamwork also, yes, right? Yes. All the chungi is more individual games. Yeah, so yeah. teamwork games actually, I personally think when when in in childhood they really need those kind of games. You know, like get along with them each other and kind of have a little bit of competitor mm-hmm. uh, mindset. And you mentioned you stay in boarding school there, mm-hmm. but you're literally you said three or two kilometer down from your school. Yes. So what required you to to stay in school? So I think my dad always wanted me to as in all all three siblings to yeah. go to a boarding school because it was it is an it is a very old school. So I think now we've we are in the 145th year. So which means almost one and a half century year old school. That's cool. Yeah. That What's we the school name? It's called Victoria. It Victoria. is named after Queen Victoria. I think it is the second oldest school in the district of Darjeeling, established in 1879. Okay, and uh, so my dad always had this ambition. He used to tell us that uh, you know, as a young child, they were not privileged enough to go to a school like that. Yeah, uh, but they would hang around in the boundary of the school and always wanted to see what the other children did in the school because there were a lot of Britishers studying in the school in the olden days. Yeah, and he always had it in his mind that one day when I have my children, I would want them to study in the school, and that is the reason why we were. sent to that school as and he really worked hard to put us or get us admission into that school and uh, be there in the boarding uh, along with the rest of the students so one of the key reasons was him but later on once we got into the boarding i think we enjoy the boarding life better than being a day scholar life so boarding i will put it in a, in a perspective so boarding in in especially in 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 darjeeling or because in nepal um, boarding means the english speaking school uh, we don't have to stay there yes. hostels we said yeah. so you study there you live there but mm-hmm. here you means boarding you study there yes. and you also sleep there and stay exactly. there right so it's a it's a boarding residential school yeah so it was quite isolated so it's not in the town so you you went to this town yeah. called krishyong so from the main town i think it's about 5 kilometers uphill drive so it's amongst the midst of the pine wood trees right so it's a very isolated area nice quiet and peaceful and it has great facility so we had a, a, a playground where we could run a 200 meter flat race uh, in in the midst of the mountains right you have this school flat where you yeah, could do is- a flat race of 200 meter which means the stretch of the flat was 200 meters it didn't have a very good breadth but it had a nice long stretch yeah. so all of these facilities were great and the fact that we had people from all walks of life we had a lot of students who came from even from nepal a lot yeah. of students from nepal came and studied i have a lot of friends from different parts of nepal who were my batchmates then we had a lot of students coming from calcutta did you talk to them oh yes oh, yes <laughs> even now okay. so quite a few students a lot of our friends were from calcutta there were quite a few students from bihar as well so it was a good mix of people from different walks of life from different cultures and the f- good thing about boarding school is we are all equal yeah right and i think uh, that was the f- best part and lastly the bonding even now like i have a lot of my friends in the in the us yes settled there quite a few as an i have another friend from nepal who is now in australia but when we meet we start from where we left <laughs> so, so like we forget uh, who we are today yeah we just connect the way we used to connect as a child That's the beauty. This I think this is uh, most of the most of people have a horrible um, experience or memory from boarding school. Like really? like hostel. Yeah, my brother, uh, younger brother who stayed almost his all entire um, childhood in boarding like n- no parents because they're all in Hong Kong. So mm-hmm. he was staying alone. Even those eight years he was alone. <laughs> like literally so he he hate he hate everyone I guess. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah, could be because you know we loved going home during vacations yeah. it was quite an eventful time for us uh you so you have two weeks vacation you go home or three weeks vacation you go home 
We used to probably be served the best meal by our parents. So it was great. And then you always look forward to coming back to school because you had this big box where yeah, you bought all the grubs. <laughs> so it was fabulous. I think the reason why I also enjoyed it is also because, you know, my parents used to visit us once in two weeks. So it didn't feel too f- oh, yeah. far away yeah. from home. So I think that was also the reason why uh, for us it was great. So as a parent, and as a, I'm also a parent, so uh, do you think you will like to send your children to <laughs> your kids to? Oh, oh yes, uh, I keep saying this to my wife. We said like, <laughs> they, should, they should go to a boarding school. Yeah. So we're already doing some amount of research to okay. figure out because the problem that has happened and the change that has taken place in the last 30 years is that there aren't too many good boarding schools. Like I would not want to put my child back into the same school that yeah. I went to because the standards have been compromised. Yeah. It isn't the same anymore. And there's been a lot of disturbance in the hills of Darjeeling. Uh, but having said that, there are quite a few boarding schools which seem to be still doing well. Yeah. So we we are on with our research in terms of where we should be putting our children if they are okay or if we can actually afford to put them in a boarding yeah. school for sure. And I mean, I also want to send my daughter to a boarding school, but mm. I mean the hostel. Yes. My wife doesn't allow us <laughs> to do that. But it's very expensive. Why? What makes them the schools in Tarzan in your experience so expensive? So. If, if you compare it to the rest of India, the schools in Darjeeling are not very expensive. Yeah, I mean, They are yeah, yeah. quite affordable, even now. And I'm not talking about government-funded schools. I'm talking about private schools. Private schools. Uh, they, are not, they are not so expensive as compared to the ones that I see towards the northern part of India. So schools here in Masuri, in Dehradun, in Nainital are pretty expensive. Uh, good standards. But the, the schools in Darjeeling are still affordable. So the locals can afford to send their children to a good convent school in Darjeeling at this point in time. So from that point of view, not so much of an issue, but definitely there's been, like I said earlier on, that there has been a great compromise in terms of quality. So we do not have the best of teachers as of now. Uh, most of the boarding schools, I think, have lost. And also the essence, because of the political disturbance in the last 30 years. right? In this there school? Are, yes. It affects everything. It affects the way of life, right? So, except for one or two schools, all of the boarding schools have been going through a miserable time and it's been very, very difficult to keep up to the standards. Uh, so, and all because of the political situation there. Okay. I think, um, I'm, now I'm coming back to a uh, little bit of uh, um, uh, social media thing. <laughs> I, you're very active in social media and then I, as I was talking to some of my friends, you, because... You call there's a the, your Instagram name is called Spirit Monk. Spirited Monk. Spirit yes. Monk. What is the story behind that? <laughs> so apart from being a bartender, apart from being who I am, uh, professionally, personally, I'm also very strongly inclined to spiritual practices. Okay. So I come from the family of monks. So my great grandfathers, all of them were monks. It is only my father who never became a monk, and then of course translated to me. But I've seen the ritualistic processes. When I was a child, so I, I have still uh, living in Delhi. I've been able to maintain my ancestral home and I keep going there very often. And I'm very connected to a lot of people who follow the monastic way of life. And I think what what has helped me over the years is that I've been able to take all of the spiritual learnings and practices and combine that with my professional life and therefore like I said earlier on in the beginning I said I live for the moment yeah so I think one of the key things that I've learned and the biggest takeaway from him for me has been mindful living right so whatever I do whether I'm making a drink whether I'm interacting with a customer at my bar whether I'm talking to a young bartender or a senior person I think I've, I've tried to make the best of everything that I do so even when I'm talking to a youngster like you I'm trying to give to a certain extent at, at the same time also take away so yeah. while I share my experiences with you there is a lot that I can, I will also learn from you right and therefore this interaction is also a meaningful interaction for me because I'm trying to involve myself as much as I can I'm living for the moment and I think one of the key things that has happened to me is through the spiritual practices I've tried to figure out that we can find happiness in small 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 things and it's right there in front of us and I think that that kind of has been able to bring a great balance uh, in my life as a professional, as well as as a human being, as a person, right? So when it used to be called Young Duplama on Insta, yeah, 
but uh, i think in 2020 when we were sitting at home doing a lot of during the, the you know, lockdown insta, yeah uh, connecting with people through through social media or the internet is when i just thought that okay uh, let me change my profile name <laughs> and convert this into the spirited monk and i think that kind of works quite well with me uh, for who i am and and how people know me so yes that's what the spirited monk is all about so you <laughs> you connect with the people you i think that this is very again very um uh, something that we we love to people to do but i don't think is possible in a few times i think we have to meet people like you more often than probably younger generation can come to that because because what happened is in our um, industry or in our time we just busy on you know like mm. running for something yep. as you know like every day we have a plan every day we want to achieve something every day we want to get something every day i wanted to have a, so many different things that sometimes it's just impossible for human mind to handle but we always forget about to live the moment. Mm. So no, I think that also comes with maturity. That's why I always say that it's great to be ambitious, but at the same time you also need to enjoy what you've achieved, right? Like today if you have one bar or you if you have two bars, yes. uh, it's quite an achievement, right? As a young professional. Yeah. So the idea is to be able to enjoy the fruits of those two bars while your ambition could be opening a more bars or doing something big in life. That's always there. uh and i think my my two bits on that aspect is yeah. to be able to you know enjoy what you have in the present moment while you could be ambitious i think it's spirituality teaches you that i think it gives you that right balance okay and helps you understand and enjoy life in a more meaningful way and that is the key as far as uh bringing in that work life balance you know in in the present day i think yes. that's very important uh we are in a fast paced world it's a very yeah. competitive world i see also in delhi is also yeah, very yeah. fast paced it's a very competitive world and i think it's not going to end it's only going to get crazier than 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 what Ever. what is like, yeah. happening now right that's going to be there but at the end of the day you are an individual and as a human being as an individual it is important that you stay happy and you enjoy so if you're ambitious and if your ambition is achieving something in life achieve it but after you achieve it you need to also enjoy it <laughs> <laughs> that's equally equally important <laughs> we forgot to enjoy and we <laughs> out of the plan is to um to achieve something and when it's time to enjoy we look for something else exactly. to achieve and something else and something sometimes it, it things doesn't work as we plan and then after even you ten success you have one unsuccessful story and then you just go back to zero no but again that is where the difference is yes i think life is all about ups and downs we have winters and we have summers the important thing is while you were successful you had a great time and then you fail once and you give up yeah my point is who oh, if you could enjoy and have great fun when you succeeded you should also be able to accept failure yeah this is very tough yeah, i think because, you know that. and and the reason why i say this is i've always been like since my childhood years uh like i said earlier on i wasn't one of those bright students yes but i was good in sports and one of the things that sports has taught me is to be able to accept defeat defeat yes yes sir. not because you didn't play well it is purely because the other person was a better player and appreciate the other person so i think in in sports you don't lose in sports it's a sportsman Civil spirit well said, right so. so in life also it is not failure it is only a way of life sometimes not getting what you want not being able to achieve what you want to achieve is a way of life it is not about failures the idea is to be able to accept it and then figure out what is it that didn't allow you to achieve what you wanted to achieve right because then you will have plan b you will probably use a different medium to be able to achieve it then right so i think accepting failure only makes you a better human being i think there's you have said very well said about the sports sports will teach you like um, losing is uh, the per, the the opponent yeah. is maybe better than you exactly right it's not yeah, like lo- losing is not the end of the world right every time you lose you want to come back stronger that is what good sportsmen do right i have seen a lot of great sportsmen lose some of the crucial games and sometimes lose in a bad way 
But what I've seen amongst some of the great sportsmen, and that's the reason why we call them great sportsmen, is because they've been able to come back from that loss as a stronger and a better sportsman, as a better performer, right? And that is what failures need to teach us. So we need to learn from the failure. <laughs> yes, that's the biggest l- yes. uh, lesson. Lesson. Yeah. I mean, for younger generation, I think I'm, I'm sure you know, we um, uh, kind of forgot how to get a failure and then accept and move on because it's everyone is just like a, it's, it's a failure comes with a lot of shame. I've made a lot of people. They don't want to be in the a business or in the in the certain competition because they're scared to get fail. Mm-hmm. So they, in their mind, if you go there, you have to win. Otherwise, you don't want to be mm-hmm. in the in the in the whole scenario. Yeah, that's true. I've seen that here in India as well. Uh, a lot of the youngsters are very scared because they think that if I go there and I don't win it, maybe I'll be. I'll be failing. But my advice is, look, if you're a young person, that's the time to be able to either succeed or fail. As a youngster, you can take risk, you know, and what it does is it only helps you to make your foundation stronger. And it is not about failure. I think there's nothing called failure. I think it's feedback. Feedback. <laughs> yeah, that's a better word to use. You know, it's instead of saying I feel, you say, oh, I got a better feedback. So it's a feedback telling you what are your uh, weaknesses, right? And you work on your weaknesses and make it stronger. That weakness can be converted into your strength, right? So uh, take it as a feedback. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a new word for failure. We take it as a feedback. Now, like, um, now um, we, we had a chat about yesterday, our uh, Kul Puja. I don't know what, is, is it, what do we call it in, in, in English? Ancestral worship. Yeah. I don't want to go through into the who, where we come from. There's something that we don't want to talk here. Mm-hmm. But at least as um, you mentioned, you are 31st, 31st, 36th? 30, 32nd generation. 32nd generation that you can um, trace back trace back to mm. all of this. So what do you think? And then I wanted to know because I also wanted to, we also do in, in our um, family, my grandfather used to do that. My father gave up, but he teach me some of the things that uh, then I, I do, but no one knows because I don't want people to think, oh man, this mm. guy is like, this is not a religion. This is something that- It's is, culture. It's culture, yeah, yes, it's exactly. This is a tradition. And now younger generation, let's let's talk about probably a Suman or maybe something. They have no idea. And then I've seen it, but I have never practiced myself. You have no idea, Suman? <laughs> <laughs> so this younger generation how do we get them these people how do we let them know just do you think because this is something I always wanted to uh, do it when my grandfather was there I mean every dozen he had like a huge thing only in the, you know like the this, me and my grandfather know um, other people so all night we do some sort of ritual and it was a stone and some um, something that we they believe as a, as a as our ancestor is in there. So I got very fascinated about it. But I didn't really, didn't really get to know much because he passed away and I moved to Hong Kong. But from your story, it just kind of remind me that. And I was like, this is so cool. How do we get to know more about this thing? So the best way to keep the cultures and the tra- traditions alive is each one of us, whether it's the Gurung or the Tamangs or even for that matter, you know, could be North Indians, South yeah. Indians. I always say one thing that it's great to take a lot of pride in your culture and tradition. Where I see it diminishing is in situations where a lot of parents yeah. are very shy yeah, yeah. to share the fact that we come from a tribal background. Yes, like I, we come true, from a tribal background, right? This is true. true. And you take a lot of, uh, you know, people shy away from it and they don't want to tell it to the children or pass it on to the children. But I always say that, look, I come from a tribal background and I take a lot of pride in it because there are some things which are so beautiful about it. And it's okay. That's my route, right? Um, Today, I might be a bartender. I fit into the schemes of things as far as the 21st century is concerned. But at the same time, there's history, there's tradition. Uh, In in Nepali, we call it parampara, right? Which means tradition. Right? Traditions are beautiful things because it lets you go back and discover where you came from, who you are. You don't have to follow the same rituals, but it's always great to know. right? And then leave it up to the children, up to the new generation to see how they want to see it. You know, It's always good to give them 
a little bit and then see how they want to take it forward. Like I don't want to force anything into my children. But uh, I do it at home. I follow the tradition and they see it because I set the right example for them. Like uh, they see me doing everything that I do. Similarly, as a child, I saw my grandparents do everything that they did. And therefore, when I became slightly more matured is when I would go back and think, oh, this is what granny used to do. This is what grandfather used to do. And now I have my own definition about what it is and how I relate it to my uh, workspace and my and my profession. And sometimes when I have to speak about myself, I bring it all together as my definition of who Young Dup Lama is. So the most important thing is to be able to take pride in who you are and where you come from. Uh, I live in Delhi. For me, Delhi has given me everything. But at this end of the day, I'm still a Darjeeling boy. Yeah. Right. And I would like to take a lot of pride in where I come from, my culture, my tradition, and even in my cocktails. A lot of times I have narrated stories that is very much linked to what I had or what I experienced as a child or things that I saw and did as a child in my ancestral home in Darjeeling, right? And it becomes a very original, true story and an inspiration for my drinks. And therefore, you know, nobody can debate it. Nobody can challenge it. Because, because you it's, have lived there. Yeah, you because it's lived. original. I'm not copying a story from elsewhere. It is purely coming from the fact that it's my own experience, right? Uh, nobody can tell it better than I do. So might as well take pride and narrate the story because every story story is a great story. Every culture is a great culture. Like when we listen to a lot of people who come from some other culture and yeah. narrate their story and their way of life into the drink, it sounds so beautiful yeah. because you say, oh, wow, that sounds so good. Let me go try it. It's the same thing with all of us. So the idea is to be able to take a lot of pride in it and whenever possible be able to narrate it through your own lens you know and that is the beauty of great cultures that we all belong to and um, so we 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 how do we let them know how do we let the young people know about this thing by you practicing it right so uh, I live in Delhi I live in Gurgaon yeah I have a house and I have a separate so-called the prayer room is called chesam yeah right so I have my own chesam which which I take a lot of pride in and my children see it every day uh, I don't force anything on them but yeah. they know that okay this room is called the chesam so they, they've started saying oh that is the chesam room right and they know that okay when you enter the room there's something different it's not like the living living room or the bedroom right it's purely about what I practice and what I want them to see not force upon them because later on when they mature as as human beings it's up to them to see and decide if they find some kind of a connect yeah if they do great if they don't still okay right but if they do and want to know more is when i'm going to give them even more right so but i've left that thing open that that option open for them similarly what i'm trying to say is how do you pass it on to the new generation yeah. you need to keep that option open not close it the problem with a lot of parents is yeah. you try to close it because you do not like i i see a lot of people from our background hesitate to say that you have a tribal background yeah. i don't understand that, why that's so true yeah. yeah i don't understand why it's okay it's a great culture let's just accept it yeah. we are meat eaters we are alcohol is part of a culture and for <laughs> me as a bartender when i say alcohol is always part of my culture it gives me a complete def- different definition that i actually knew alcohol uh even when I was born. Yeah. Right. So, so, so it's a, it's a fabulous thing to be able to narrate to the rest of the world. Get it. They, then I, so when I, when I check two of the bars, um, uh, especially the speakeasy, you put a lot of, um, uh, uh, let's say Nepalese food in Darjeeling inspired food. So, and it's or most of them, you say some of them is your family's recipes. Yeah. So if, when you open, you know, you're going to do this or like, is just uh, getting a long time again same like okay because that's a speakeasy bar and when I went there the vibe is amazing that is, is super nice mm. of course sidecar has a different vibe but that place has a different vibe and the food the thali and then the buff momo and then the aloo kochar <laughs> is that's next level we just love that a lot so how, how did you come up with that concept you know, it was very simple so when we opened this bar 10 years ago uh, the, the food was again it was it was mostly continental it was more bar food but all of the dishes were uh, 
Western food, right? But all of the guys working in the kitchen were from Kathmandu because uh, one week before we opened the place, our chef left us. As in, we had to let go of the chef okay. because of some disciplinary yeah. issues. And then be- along with him, the rest of the kitchen staff also left. So we were not let, we like, we had a kitchen. We were about to open one week. So what was the concept? From- so the concept is still Western food, right? Yeah. So we had all sorts of Western food, right? From fish and chips to lamb shanks yeah. to all of those things. Uh, you know, we had these flatbreads and of course uh, the sliders. So we had all of those things in the menu. And then what I had to do is in order to keep it intact and to stick to the timelines, I called up a friend in Kathmandu and said, look, I do not have any guy, any anybody to work in the kitchen. Yeah. So I need some help. And he organized uh, some guys from, from Kathmandu and my younger brother, who also happens to be a trekker, had this other guy who used to cook in the trek. And he was a great guy. So he used to cook. He used to do a lot of innovative stuff in up in the mountains while trekking. So he said, okay, I'm, he's free. I'm going to send him. So all of these guys came together. They all came from Nepal and set up a kitchen there. And these guys were talented fellows. It's just that they were not, you know, qualified enough to call themselves chefs. Yeah, yeah. But they were absolute fabulous home cooks. Recipe. Yeah, they were fabulous cooks. So with a set of four, five of them, we we started the kitchen and we we did Conti food. And we kept on doing it for the first three years. It's after the third year is when we started to realize that we had all our kitchen staff coming from Nepal. Yeah. And then sometimes as experiments, so we used to do a little, you know, of our local dishes here and there. And these yeah, guys yeah. used to make it amazingly well. And every time I gave it to a guest, they would say, wow, this is fabulous. <laughs> and then my partner, Minakshi, came up to me and said, why don't we just convert all our food into Himalayan food? Because this is something that we know again, because I've, Grown up eating that food, yeah. so you know it very well. Also, the fact that I mentioned earlier on that we are tribals and meat eating and drinking is part of a culture. I realized culturally also that food really works well with alcohol, right? Yeah. And that's when we said, okay, let's just convert everything in the menu to making it Himalayan. And that's how we converted the whole thing. And for the guys also, because it's part of their home recipes, it's very easy. So now... Uh, it's been five years that we've actually got this menu. But in the place has been open for 10 years. Yeah. And the inspiration in the food is purely from a lot is, a lot of it comes from Newari culture. Yeah. A lot of it also comes from the Himalayan belt in Nepal, in Sikkim, in Bhutan. And we've got all of those ingredients. I go back home. Whenever I go back home, I bring in some of the key ingredients. All my kitchen guys, when they go home, or even my front of the house people, when they go home, they bring in something. And we all take a lot of pride and we all feel very happy. Also for the guys, it's very easy to explain what that food is all about. Yes, yes. Because they, <laughs> as you, as, as we just talked about, because they grew up yeah. eating and then experienced that, all the food and then the flavors. Hmm. <laughs> they, I think we are good for now. But I have a, a big question that I always ask. What kind of message you want to uh, pass it to the younger generation about anything? Yeah. About, See, anything, about anything. It doesn't have to be... Um, um, uh, about the the drink or food or uh, what this as a life and what you see my advice yes. as somebody who has lived almost half my life is that you know uh, a little a little coming from my spiritual learning also is yes. that we have you know we have the best life as human beings you know so might as well make take advantage of this one life that we yeah. have as a human being so find happiness and be happy, right? Having said that, it's very easy to define happiness, but how do you find happiness? It is very simple. Whatever you do in life, whether you become an engineer or doctor, or whether you become a, a professional, like a bartender or an advertising professional, or a marketeer, whatever you do in life, do it with a lot of love, right? And find happiness in whatever you're doing. So. For example, today I'm a bartender, yep. you are a bartender. I think our life would not have been as great if we could not find happiness within the bar. For right? sure. You similarly, can't <laughs> yeah, similarly for a doctor, happiness is seeing that a sick gets well, right? By by his analysis and his diagnosis of the disease and the medicine that he gives. So when he sees uh, a sick person come to him and then he can convert that sick person into a into a a person who kind of gets 
well after that. I think it's the greatest achievement of a doctor and that is what he connects to and the greatest doctors always connect to it. The great teachers, you know, a great teacher or, or for a lot of teacher, the happiness comes when they see their student achieve bigger heights uh, in their lives, right? So the idea is to find happiness in whatever we do. And there is nothing called big and small. Yep. There's nothing called better work and, you know, bad work. Every profession is a great profession. Every human being is talented. Never ever underestimate yourself. Because I've also seen a lot of youngsters saying, oh, you know, I can't achieve this because yeah, I'm not as intelligent. True. Uh, believe in yourself. Like, as I said, I was a mediocre student. I only knew the art of passing exams. I somehow managed to pass exams. But today when I see, I see, oh, it was good that I only managed to pass exams because the kind of fun that I had as a boarding student, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the studious guys didn't have that fun because I used to bunk school. I used to be naughty. I did a lot of, uh, I, I've got a lot of beating also from my principal <laughs> for being a naughty student. So I've done all of those things that I used to play. So I did everything. And so, you know, I have no regrets that at the age of 15, I couldn't enjoy life. I enjoyed life as a 15 year old and I still enjoy life as a 50 year old purely because I think I've lived for the moment. And while living in the moment, I've also tried, to, I, I, I've kind of discovered to find happiness in what I do. So I think that has kept me going, right? So my suggestion is don't est underestimate yourself. Yeah. As a human being, we all have this one gift from God. And we all can really excel when we discover that one gift. The only thing as a human being is try and see and figure gift? out what that gift is. <laughs> Because everybody has a gift. Some people have the gift of the gap. Some people speak very well. Yes. And I'll give you an example because I'm in this profession yeah, yeah. of bartending. Mm. I've seen that there are some bartenders who are very creative in their mind. So they're really creative. And their creativity knows no bounds, right? They can create yeah. They can create such wonderful things when they're behind the bar. There are some people who are average cocktail makers, but they speak really speak well. Really they well. connect yeah, with yeah. people very well, right? So, and that is their gift. There are some people who do not have the creativity, may not have the gift of the gap, but they are very knowledgeable people. They are very good with that, doing very well. There are some people who are not practically very good. They're not good in making drinks. They're not very good in, uh, you know, working. Yeah. But they're good on social media and they're successful. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, what I'm trying to say is everybody has this one, one gift. gift. As a human being, try and discover that gift. The day you've discovered that gift, you will be successful. <laughs> and success does not always relate to how much money you've made. Yeah. Success this is... There's no measure. Yeah. Success is, when you look back at life, does it bring a smile on your face? I think that is success. And every youngster should try to achieve that. And that, that I think, is absolutely doable if you use a little bit of your common sense and discover it. So my suggestion and my advice is... Yep. Do not underestimate yourself. Do not think that you can't do what others can't do. All of us, it's the same world. We all are born as human beings, uh, everything intact. So if somebody else can achieve certain heights in life, we all can achieve it. Uh, so just go for it and discover that one gift that God has given and you. And just live the moment. This, yes, absolutely. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for all the time. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Cheers.